story for a couple of reasons, because as you are navigating your way through law school, your passion may not be children's issues. But I encourage you to search your heart and your soul to figure out something in your life that you can be passionate about. Your nine to five may be tax law, but your passion may be advocating for people of health homes. Your nine to five might be patent law, but your passion may be literacy action so that a mother can read to her two-year-old. And that a father might be able to read so that he can get a better job. And that a mother might be able to get work in a way that she can put a roof over her child's head. Whatever that is, I would encourage you as we talk about passion, purpose, and a story to tell. I don't need to tell you, because I have researched this information in thinking about what I'd say to you today about percentage-wise the declining number of African Americans in law school. But I will tell you that I'm particularly concerned. So there's been this whole conversation about more African American men in prison than are on college campuses. But let me tell you, the systemic issue is that between 1985 and 2000, nationally we saw an increase in the spending on the correction side. Nearly double that of the increase that we saw on higher education. And in some instances, some reports say that the increase in spending on higher education in this nation between 85 and 2000 by states was 24%, while states increased their budget for corrections, i.e. prisons, by 166%. I am concerned that our money is being really spent more on housing and warehousing people in prison. I'm particularly concerned when I see the numbers of our children dropping out, when the statistics talk about a child dropping out of school somewhere in America every minute of every hour of every day. Why is that important? It's important because we don't need our children dropping out of school. It is particularly important for where I've sat for so many years that a child who drops out of school is three and a half times more likely to have a criminal record than a child who finishes high school seven times more likely to be dependent at some point in his or her lifetime on welfare, and three times as likely to then have a child who will then drop out of school. We are looking at some serious issues when you talk about the number of black children who are involved in the juvenile justice system. It is absolutely staggering. But I'm not going to dwell on statistics because I really want to talk about the hopefulness of this and what we've got to do to, to be lifted to higher ground. I am particularly stressed at the report that came out January 2007 and said that for every black male baby born this year, that year being on seven, that one in three of them would spend some time in prison during their lifetime. That's outrageous. One in three of every one of our black male children Born last year, it's predicted that they will spend some time in prison. That's the prediction. What I've come to say to you is that does not have to be our reality. And so we have got to be in the business of lifting as we climb. We've got to be in the business of advocating for after school programs and, pro and programs that touch our children. It's easy to talk about three strikes and you're out. The more responsible, committed, conversation in America has to be, what do we do to give our children value practice so there are no strikes? That's the conversation that we absolutely have to have in America. And so I want to share with you, as I promised that I would be law, you know, it's really, really, really risky to invite somebody who has a law degree <laughs> and grew up in a Southern Black Baptist church. But I, I promised that I was not going to be long. Let me say one thing about, a couple of things about leadership, though, before I get to this last story. I just really am concerned about leadership in this country. Uh, and I will tell you that 
You know, I just am sick and tired of leaders that point rather than lead with conviction. And I'm sick and tired of leaders that don't understand that leadership <laughs> is a privilege and not a power play. So the world needs leaders who really understand that you can't lead unless you're willing to serve. And so we need generations, and I'm looking at them, I know I'm looking at them, generations of strong, a new generation of strong servant leaders who will understand that they have got to figure out how we lift this nation to higher ground. We need leaders who are committed and compassionate, and Lord knows we need some leaders who are confident. And so I believe in you. special, special privilege, Samantha, when this invitation was extended for me to come and share with you today. I don't take this lightly, and I take it as a wonderful, wonderful opportunity just to be in touch with you. Because I know that there is tremendous power, a tremendous potential in this room that will change this nation. And I just want you to know, if you don't hear anything else I say today, that I am here to say that I am cheering you on. That I believe in you, that I believe that God has given us a new generation of young men and women who will make a difference. And perhaps you are at this place, at this time, in the history of the world for such a time as this. And so, passion and purpose and a story to write, I want to tell you my own story. And you're going to go like, what has this got to do with me being in law school? Who work with me? When I get to the end, you'll understand. I was six years old. I was in the first grade. And I will tell you, Madam President, I hate it. I hate this school. You know, I didn't understand the concept of dropping out. You know, that was, I didn't get that. You know, you don't understand the first grade about dropping out. If you did, you couldn't do it anyway. <laughs> but I hated school. I did. I just hated it. Kindergarten was cool. It was cool. Kindergarten was cool. <laughs> I got to go and play with my friends and, you know, eat cookies and hang out and, you know, sing and all that kind of stuff. But this first grade stuff was really a drag. <laughs> uh, because I knew how to read. My parents were avid readers. My mother was a school teacher. I knew how to read before I got to school. So I'm sitting there, bored out of my mind, with the Dixie Jane Runners. Now, see, y'all are too young to know this. Y'all don't know those kind of books, right? Anybody who's as old as I am in this audience, y'all remember Dixie Jane Run, Miss Mayor? Spot, jump, come on. It was C. I was so upset. 